I finally did it. I stopped getting all my meals at China 360 Food Comma Bakery, the Chinese place down the street. I am cooking again like a normal adult. I know a lot of you aren't there with me. A lot of you are slaves to that dorm food in the college or just going at old school. Old school, going home on the weekends to get some food with mom. But you don't need to do like that. You don't need to be like that. You can make cool meals all alone in your home. Last night, I made crispy buttermilk catfish with roasted delica squash. And I still have no idea what the hell delica squash really is. Is that growing on a tree? Is it growing in the ground? I don't know. All I do know is you can make amazing meals with Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you all the food that you need prepackaged with step-by-step instructions so you become this masterful chef in the in the middle of it. You're growing a mustache. You're talking in booby de bopities. You're like an Italian chef for the first time in your life making the best food you've ever had. So I'll be short. Go into the description of this episode. Scroll on down through the description and find that link to get $30 off your first Blue Apron order to start making free, not free, why, why did I say free? Nothing's free in life. To start making healthy, easy, tasty meals by yourself in your home with the help of Blue Apron. Now on to the episode. I am not even in this episode. I'm just a sage from above. But I do have the really cool opportunity to have edited this episode. Normally me and Josh do all the editing. And that gave me a cool time where I got to listen to the episode as a viewer and really start to take in what was going on, which was really cool. Josh had on two guests, um, as you see in the description, and you're going to listen. Uh, Tim Huffman, a professor at SLU, and Alex Miller. And they had a really awesome discussion, I've got to say, about poverty. They discussed the difference between urban poverty and homelessness. But also, I think they, they got into this really cool discussion about urban poverty versus rural poverty because I think so often we put those in the same box, even though they deal with such different issues, especially in Missouri, in a place like Missouri where you have St. Louis and the poverty that exists in St. Louis. And then you also have the part of Missouri that's the meth capital of the world and the rural poverty that exists there. So I was really excited that they got into that stuff. And then they finish with – why we view people with homes so differently. What does it mean to have a home? I really love that at some point in the, in in the time Tim makes the distinction of not calling people homeless, but those experiencing homelessness. And I think this is a really wonderful point he makes that we need to start adding humanity back into the way we not only talk about these people, but interact with these people. So I know you're really going to enjoy this episode with Josh, Tim and Alex. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Entitled to My Friend's Opinion. It is just Josh here today. Unfortunately, as you know, Bob and Brian are spread across the country. Bob and Brian have just started teaching at uh, public school. Or no, Brian's at a private school and Bob's at a public school. So I know they've got a podcast coming up pretty soon about teaching at those different types of schools that I'm really excited to hear. And so hopefully they can get time to, to get that together pretty soon. Um, but wish them luck in their newest adventures. But today we've got a really, really cool topic that I can't believe we haven't explored on this podcast yet, but we're going to talk about urban poverty and homelessness. And now I know what you're saying, urban poverty and poverty, aren't they kind of the same thing? But no, we have two people here who would tell you they're different. So I want you to welcome into the studio, Tim Huffman and Alex Miller. Tim, how are you doing today? Doing great. Alex, how are you over there? Doing well. Thank you for having us on, Josh. Of course. And I know Alex is a fellow listener and a fellow SLU student, and Tim is a professor here at St. Louis University. Tim, would you give us a little bit of your background and kind of how you came to SLU and and how you got into this idea of homelessness and urban poverty? Because it is really kind of an interesting thing to get into. Sure. So maybe the medium length version of the story is I was reading some really provocative books And based on the way that they wrote about and thought about poverty and the experience of poverty, I chose to live my life for six months without a home. 
And immediately after that, I went into my PhD program. And so I was studying communication, but from this kind of framework of how can my work in the academic world and in the activist world be in the service of people who are experiencing homelessness and radical urban poverty. And so I kind of made myself an activist scholar and have taught at Jesuit schools since my graduation. I study communication and how nonprofits organize in response to social issues, particularly centered around homelessness and poverty. And then, Alex, how did you as a student get into this idea of urban poverty and homelessness? Because that's kind of an interesting thing to, to stumble across. Yeah. So uh, last year, at the beginning of the year, uh, the president of an organization on campus called Labra uh, gave a speech for the convocation. Uh, his name is Corey James. And uh, he, he talked about an experience he had with a uh, fellow man on the street, his name uh, I will not name, but I have met him, and he's just amazing. Um, so I decided that that first week of school, I would go out with Labra to kind of explore this topic that he had talked about during his speech. Um, and the conversation I had with a man that night uh, was absolutely formative, and I've been, I have been uh, going to Labra now uh, every Wednesday night for the most part, for the better part of a year and a half. Now. And for the listeners at home who may not know, will you tell us what Labra is? Yeah, so Labra is a student organization. We meet uh, every Wednesday night. Uh, we start the night by cooking some food and spending some time in fellowship with each other, um, learning more about the fellow students around Slew's campus. Um, and the food changes every week, so we're always trying to test some of our cooking skills that we're learning in our apartments. Um, after that, we do a short reflection, um, kind of something to focus on that night as we go out and serve the homeless. Uh, kind of the motto of Labra is food as a com- as a excuse me food as an excuse for conversation. Um, so we like to go out, we serve food for. I would say maybe five to 10 minutes. Um, And then we sit down for about two hours and just have a conversation with those that are experiencing homelessness in St. Louis. Um, We're forming these friendships and we go back to these sites every week um, to continue these friendships. And then we come back to SLU and kind of debrief, um, catch everyone up on the conversations they had, the people they met, um, and kind of talk about the deeper issues with, um, within the homelessness um, here in St. Louis. And what are some trends you've noticed from being in Labra? Is there kind of an issue that's maybe St. Louis-centric, that, or is there an issue that you would say is kind of nationally-centric? What would you say you've learned the most from, from being in Labra? I would say the thing that I've uh, taken away most from Labra is that to define homelessness and to define someone that is experiencing homelessness is an extremely difficult topic to cover um, just because everyone has a different experience coming into um, their homeless experience. So they could have different root causes of their homelessness as well as different ways that they're experiencing homelessness, um, which I think we'll be touching on a little bit later on. But I came into Labra thinking that there was only one type of person that was experiencing homelessness, uh, but actually there are millions and millions of different stories out there that need to be heard. So that's actually a great way to kick us off. And Tim, if you wouldn't mind going into a little bit about kind of what I posed in the intro, and that's just the difference between urban and rural poverty, because I think people, like I said, don't really necessarily identify a difference between those two, if if you would say that's accurate. I kind of am speaking here from layman's terms, not having done a lot of uh, background knowledge on, on homelessness. So what would you say are kind of the major aspects of urban poverty versus rural poverty? Sure. So you can think of poverty as it's distributed at a global level. So, right, there's issues of, you know, global trade, economic uh, issues, transportation, things like this. And then, right, if you're homeless in a uh, or radically poor in a city, that's going to change your experience than if you're radically poor in the country. Um, maybe like the cheap way of making the distinction between urban and rural poverty is to say that people who live in the city are space poor and people who live in the country are service poor. So in the city, if you don't have money, there's no space for you. There's no place that you can actually be. It costs money to hang out in Starbucks. It costs money to go to the mall. It costs money to occupy space. Whereas there are plenty of services. There are lots of human service agencies. There's a density of nonprofit organizations. And even the waste streams of for-profit agencies can be tapped by people who live in the city, right? So there's more, you know, wasted food. You can find clothing that's been thrown away, right? There's more service. 
But the flip side, if you live in the country, um, you're less likely to be shelterless because you can usually find something deep in the country where no one's going to find you and you can set up a little shelter out of some recycled things. Uh, but if you have a heart attack at two o'clock in the morning, you're going to be in serious trouble because nobody knows where you're at and no one is going to find you. Um, and so the human service part uh, becomes a lot harder when you're farther out in the city. Very interesting. And would you say that I don't want to like put a distinction on which one may be better, but do you think there's like what are some of the unique challenges of being that space poor that you've talked about? Because from my, you know, in my, in my opinion, having that space is maybe not as important as having those services. I don't know if you can touch on that because if you have that, if you don't have that space, well, you're in the city. And I, and I know a place that I've done some work at is the uh, Denver Homeless Mission, which is in, in Denver, obviously. And, and that's a place where homeless people can go during the night. Do you say, like, are there more space opportunities, though, than there are service opportunities for rural people? Um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, if, uh, both are hard, right? Poverty sucks. <laughs> uh, and if there's not, nothing else uh, than from this hour of listening that you get. Yeah, that should be one of them. Um, it's hard. Um, living in the city without a space uh, is profoundly dehumanizing. You are showering in public. You are having your arguments in public. You are storing your belongings in public. And maybe you can find a nonprofit organization who will let you do one or two or three of those things. But they're going to have hours that you have to access. They're going to have particular rules. Those rules might remind you of a system that you're already sick and tired of. So you may not be willing to put up, want to deal with it. So, yeah, I mean, there's something incredibly hard about not having a space where you're just allowed to be. Um, and the truth is all of us are contingently housed. All of us could become homeless at any moment. All of us have to follow rules. But there's a kind of security that we imagine that we have that is threatened, eroded, and then it's just gone when you're very poor and you're living in the city because there's really no place for you. And even if you find some door that is willing to be open to you for some amount of time, it's not going to be open all of the time. And there's still going to be a set of agreements that have to be followed. And yeah, it's very unstable. And that is hard. Well, I don't think we think about space and, and living spaces enough. And that's really interesting what you brought up, because I think about it, and I would say probably all three of us in here have an a, B, C, and D plan for living. So let's say I got kicked out of my apartment, evicted or something like that. I could go live with my parents. I can go live with a friend. I can go, you know, I have all these other people I can go rely on. But a lot of times when you're homeless, and correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of times when you're homeless, the other people you're interacting with are most likely home other homeless people, right? Is that correct? Or are you interacting more with people who are providing the services? I mean, it kind of depends on who you are and why you're homeless and where you live, right? Um, so I think Alex's initial point, uh, which is that homelessness isn't a single monolithic thing. So maybe in order to answer this question, we should kick out just a, a couple of versions of being homeless. So like, let's lay out like the first and most imagined stereotype. Homeless people are addicted to drugs or mentally ill. But if you study the entire population of people who live without shelter in the United States, those two populations account for less than 40% together than all the people who live without shelter. So, like, the stereotype isn't even the majority. It's in the minority. Um, so when you add to that, yes, uh, some people are mentally ill, their mental illness is not currently treated, and they can't uh, access the various aspects of society that keeps their lives stable, and that leads to a certain kind of homelessness. Or they're homeless, and because of that, it puts strains on their bodies and therefore their minds in ways that develop mental illnesses that otherwise weren't there, right? They're co-causing. But I could be homeless because I'm the victim of domestic violence um, and running away from a dangerous situation. Um, I could be homeless because uh, of a relational collapse, because I myself don't make enough money because I'm too young or I don't have the job to take care of myself. And a relational collapse um, means that I choose to leave or I get kicked out. I might become homeless because I get sick and then lose my job because I'm sick and lose, lose my health insurance because I lost my job and then all of my money goes to paying my health expenses, and then I'm homeless and jobless and sick. Um, I could be homeless because I live in the wake of a hurricane, and all of my things are currently being blown over, right? In Florida, people are homeless, right? In Texas, people are homeless. Um, 
and uh, the material structure of your house, if it's gone, you're homeless. Uh, you might not think of yourself that way. Uh, we, that might not be the stereotype, but um, when you start to kick out the definitions, um, when you migrate, you're homeless. When you move, you're homeless. Some people choose to live without homes for ascetic reasons or spiritual reasons. Um, yeah, it's really a pretty expansive list. So a question like, well, most people who are living with homel homelessly, um, who do they interact with? Well, it, it depends. They might be a graduate student uh, living in their car, getting their PhD. It could be you know, a, a mom running away with her three kids because uh, her partner has been abusing her, right? And Alex, this is something that we talked a little bit about off air too, was just kind of like defining homelessness is so difficult because as Tim just brought up, there's so many different types of homelessness. And I think, yes, it, and I've even had that kind of traditionalist view of drug addicts and the mentally ill are the ones who are homeless, but there's so many different types of homeless people. And as Tim just laid out, do you want to go into a little bit more about kind of like the types of homelessness and maybe why people end up in those certain positions? It's a weighted question only for the fact that a whole bunch of reasons play into each individual situation of why someone ends up in homelessness. Um, I would like to start just by saying that um, how we define what a home is is kind of an interesting topic to explore as well. Um, and Tim did this actually in a reflection at one of our uh, Labra outings. Um, and so kind of the, the main takeaways from that are home is a place where we're comfortable, where we like to go back to. Um, it, it might not even be an actual house. It could be an apartment. It could be a friend's couch. If you're comfortable there, um, that could be where you live and what your home is. And the second is that a home feels safe. Um, that's kind of going on with the comfort, comfort factor. Um, but you're going to go to a place where you feel safe. So like Tim mentioned, uh, those that might be running away from domestic abuse, they could, they could have a home. Um, they could own that home, but that place is not comfortable and that place is not safe for them to go back to, and thus they end up homeless. Or if they are staying in that home, are they are they homeless or are they um, are they not? So how how we define the home uh, based on that comfort and that safety is also um, an interesting topic to explore. Um, it could be a, an entire podcast as well. Right, because the home is the material stru structure. But there's also the social structure that exists around the material structure that defines it as a home or not. And if you don't have the economic resources to maintain that as defined as your home, then you'll lose it even if the structure stays. But then there's also the subjective or imagined experience of a place, right? Do I feel at home here? And so, yeah, definitions of homelessness vary. So the housing and urban development, uh, they define it um, as lack of a fixed structure designed for human habitation, right? Um, so they don't count someone living under a bridge as homed, even if that person feels at home there, right? They would define that as without home. Um, and so, yeah, so there's the subjective imagined space, there's a material space, and there's the kind of social space around it. And it's hard to pin down exactly where all of those things are, because as you move forward with different definitions, it literally means some people are and aren't homeless, depending on which definition you go by. And to kind of go off of what Tim talked about there, uh, I met a, a young man this summer. Um, his name, I won't say, but we'll, we'll call him John for the, the purpose of the story. Um, John has been without a home, as we typically define it, um, now for the good most of his life, uh, for the most part of his life. So um, talking with him, he is more comfortable now staying on the street and uh he kind of considers himself more of like an Alexander Supertramp type person where he's more comfortable just walking everywhere he goes. Um, so he walked from Louisiana, where he's from, over to Arizona, um, walked back to Louisiana, is and is now making his way north um, to Minnesota. So he says, I just go where the wind blows me, and that's pretty much where I'm comfortable is living on the street and making these connections with my friends on the street. And obviously that's one story, but do do people like John ha necessarily, are they looking for something when they kind of quote unquote wander or are they just r literally going where the wind takes them? Is it kind of like, especially if you're wandering from city to city, are you looking for something better? Are you looking for something new or are you just kind of moving? In John's case specifically, because I did talk to him about this, uh, he has no 
place that he wants to end up. He is just most comfortable on the street, um, kind of surviving based on the generosity of people um, like those in Labra to give him food, um, to ver provide him with blankets and warmth. Um, but there are a million others out there that have a goal to end up at a place, um, to find a job, to find stable housing. Um, so each story is going to be different. Um, and that kind of plays into how to even solve homelessness is going to be a very complex issue as well, because not every person experiencing homelessness wants the exact same thing. So I, I want to pick up on this, uh, the, um, the intentional I'm wandering around and, uh, experiencing homelessness by choice thing. So one of the conversations I find myself having a lot is whether or not people choose to be homeless. Um, and I think that there's kind of like a split consciousness that's really necessary for reflecting on this issue. So on the one hand, I think that all people should foster a, a reasonable amount of empathy for why someone might choose to live without a house. Um, on the one hand, we can learn a lot from people whose lives are different from ourselves. And so respecting the legitimate lifestyle choices of another person um, means that you can be vulnerable to the lessons that they can teach you. Um, and so I, I very much um, have met people uh, who have, quote unquote, chosen to live without homes. I met, met a young man one time uh, who just said that when he lived in four walls, he became irresponsible and selfish. And when he lived out and had to work every day to survive, he always thought about other people and what he was doing in the world. And I found him in city council meetings, advocating on behalf of people who lived on the streets. And I really honestly believe that he chose to be homeless. However, on the other side, there are people who tell me they choose to be homeless, but I'm not sure that were they given reasonable alternatives that they would continue to choose it, right? So when thinking rationally, we, we think about what choices are available to us and then we choose one of them. So understanding the choice to or not to be homeless has to be held in the context of the other choices, right? So if my choices are between being beaten up by my significant other and living on the streets, I might choose to live on the streets, but that's a shitty choice that represents profound injustice. And we shouldn't be like, oh, well, they chose to be homeless, so whatever, right? Um, or, oh, there are services out there, they just chose it. Um, or they don't need my do dollar, they, they chose this, right? Um, th that discourse of choice gets deployed to make people who are suffering poverty um, uh, to be seen as though they deserve their suffering, right? And so um, I, I just, it's, it's a pet peeve of mine, uh, this notion of the person who's like, who uh, uh, merely idolizes, uh, oh yeah, like this choice uh, to live homelessly. Um, because there's something to be said for like, you know, I, I can give a person an example, like you like somebody, you, maybe you ask them out, they say no, and part of the way you get over them is convince yourself that you never wanted to be with them anyway. Right? And if you think about that at a social level, there's a certain kind of person who has tried a lot to make their way through life and they have been shit on time and time again in various ways and taken advantage of and exploited and not given the things that they need. And there becomes a point where you're like, no, I don't want a part of that society. And so I sometimes think the choice represents harms done and crappy alternatives as opposed to only this like idyllic like uh, uh, pursuit of self uh, and, and, and other. Does that make sense? Anyway, rant off. No, that makes a lot of sense. And it's, and it's really interesting to, to think about because a lot of times we don't really, I don't even like necessarily think of the homeless as either choosing or not choosing to be homeless. You kind of think of them as like, it's a chronic systematic sort of like they were put there. Whereas you do have some of these situations where people are homeless, but Alex kind of brought up originally maybe this culture of homelessness and kind of, you know, I think about it some, sometimes like you hear prisoners say they're more comfortable in prison than they are in, in society. And so I'm sure there's, this happens a lot in homelessness where you're just more comfortable in in being homeless than you are living kind of in a home and, and being a part of, I don't know, quote unquote, normal societies, as we'll call it. What do you think, like, what is kind of the motivation you see of homeless to get out of homelessness? Are they really attempting to, to fight and use these services that are available to them? Or is it kind of like, okay, get rejected once and I'm not going to try again with, um, 
you know, attempting to get out of homelessness. What do you kind of see? I don't know if there's necessarily a percent you can put on it, but just kind of from your interactions, what do you see? From, so from my interactions, every single person I talk to has a deep desire for something. I think we all have that deep desire for something. Um, and when you are sleeping on a hard ground every night, um, if it's 10 degrees outside, you're going to desire for, at that moment to be in warmth and possibly on a, a nice comfortable bed. Um, so not, complicated. not, it's not complicated. What, what are our basic needs? Um, am I uncomfortable, um, in this situation? Yes, I'm getting frostbitten. I'm on an uncomfortable ground. So there's always a desire f- that we all have to be comfortable and to be in a better situation. Um, now, As Tim mentioned, some of these people might have grown up in a situation where they might have been on the street since they were 13 and 14 years old. And so most of their life experience has been on the street. So do they actually know kind of what a comfortable life, as we might call it, entails? Do they know what it's like to sleep on a bed, to have electricity at all times to have access to clean water where you don't have to go into a public service to get that water where you can just get a water bottle at a store or something like that or you get it um, maybe from your house or a library Um, so kind of what we're what they're desiring is that comfort level um, but each person is going to find that comfort in a different way or their immediate needs are going to kind of dictate what that desire is going to be I wanted to have a sidebar for a moment. Is that okay? Let's go for it. Let's yeah, go yeah, for yeah. It. Sidebar. So I study communication, and so one of the things that I pay attention to is the way that we language social issues, and um, the because language often limits the boundaries of our thought, and because language is the thing that we use to coordinate action. So I'm going to call you two out. Is that okay? All right. So one, I I prefer not the phrase the homeless. Um, so it erases, uh, a, like when we say, oh, there's this uh, diversity, right? So when you say the homeless, it's very monolithic, as though there's one group of people. And the word people is also absent from that phrase. Um, and so one of the things that I, I challenge people to do is to think in terms of um, homelessness as an experience uh, or homelessness uh, as a state of affairs. And so I prefer people living without homes or people experiencing homelessness, if you really want to use the word homeless. Um, and then, Alex, I, I would also challenge um, uh, in, in, in your last uh, reflection, um, there's very much like a, a we and them. Um, and the truth of the matter is uh, any of the three of us could actually be homeless, but not yet identified to the other. So you can never assume in a conversation where you're talking about homeless that we means the homed, because you could be including someone who's currently without shelter in the we. Um, and then, of course, that works for the them also, right? Um, some people you think are currently homeless aren't, um, and uh, you may one day be the them, uh, in which case it'll be in us. Um, and so, yeah, uh, that's my, uh, my, my teacher moment. To actually add on to that, uh, a few of my experiences out on Labra have, I've actually come into contact with SLU students um, that graduated with a degree from St. Louis University two to ten years ago. Um, Tim actually ran into one of his former students on the street. So it, we are like at the brink of homelessness. Even with a college degree, we could be uh, homeless, you know, within a day or a week. So thank you for correcting me. And, and yeah. Yeah, and now I've got some homework to do during the rest of this podcast. So those without homes, I'll, I'll try to remember that uh, the homeless no longer those without homes. So good to good to identify. I want to talk a bit, little bit about too, like what are some solutions that we can conceive for homelessness? Because a lot of times, you know, asking for money, they're asking for you know the and and actually I do want to make a distinction. Is there typically, and I've heard it, and I don't know if this is a wives' tale or not, but. Um, kind of you know you see the the people begging on the streets typically are not those who are without homes is that is that typically accurate would you say I mean I've just kind of seen you know you see the stories about people who are you know begging on the streets and end up making a couple hundred dollars a day and then go back to you know low-income housing or go back to um you know an actual you know an apartment or place like that is there a diff you know where where does the distinction lie 
so th there are a handful of questions in there. I want to chew off first the uh, asking for money on the streets. It's a shitty job. I, I, I contend that if you compare whatever job you have to sucking down the exhaust fumes, getting it's like it's like customer service, but worse, right? Like people treat you really poorly all day long um, and you're standing on concrete and you have no shade um, and you have no you're completely exposed to the elements it's a crappy job if somebody it's rare I think to make a hundred dollars begging on the streets I think it would be a hard earned hundred dollars I just do um, it's it's a hard job uh, the broader question you asked though is what are some solutions to homelessness yeah, I would say, like, what are some, some kind of straightforward solutions, maybe looking at it from the aspect of those without homes and then looking at it from the aspect of us? So kind of like the, the two different paths we can take there. Yeah, so in some ways it's really complicated and in some ways it's really simple. The way that you solve a particular person's homelessness is... A home, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, not really that complicated. And so we could define home, right, materially, socially, imaginatively, right? And then you could work to provide that for the person who didn't have it, right? It's like foodlessness is not like a wildly complicated thing. Like you get the person food and they're not foodless anymore, right? Um, that being said, um, we live in a, a complicated world um, where the experience of home and the materiality of home is not um, necessarily easily conjured, particularly given other um, deeply entrenched issues surrounding poverty. Um, so the, the kind of like the, the, the line, uh, if you're in human services, is prevention, deflection, and housing. So strategy one is to take people who are on the brink of homelessness and change the things about their material and social structure such that they, don't, they never become homeless. I mean, that's how you solve a root problem is you just stop it from ever happening, right? So for instance, um, failing to be able to pay your utilities is a pretty good indicator that you might become homeless in the near future, right? So is there a way that uh, you could structure services so that when people started failing to pay their utilities, they could get the kinds of support that they need. And utility companies, you know, try to intervene in this in some ways and their community action um, organizations that help people pay their utilities or St. Vincent de Paul, right? So there are, there's the prevention side, right? Um, then if someone becomes homeless because of a set of kind of like temporary or sudden factors, then diversion or deflection diversion is the strategy you would use then so basically you wouldn't have them like learn how to go through the shelters and learn how to get all of their food from food pantries and learn all of these skills that they might not need if you could just kind of like level out that crater that they're experiencing get them in a hotel get them some food get them kind of back on their feet sort out whatever problem caused their immediate homelessness and then just have them continue to live their ordinary life without having their whole life tapping to be derailed. But that kind of quick intervention doesn't work if someone who has been homeless for a very long time or their incidence of homelessness um, is uh, profound or highly intractable or hard to solve, right? So um, you take someone who is 62 years old who has worked in construction all of their life and they break their back while they're at work let's say they weren't properly documented while they were employed there, and because of that, they can't really get um, the right kind of severance that you would expect them to get, and so now they're on disability social security, um, which, say, like in Los Angeles, might get you a couple hundred dollars, and there's no way that you can get housing for a couple hundred dollars a month in Los Angeles. So now you're homeless, right? So then housing becomes the solution, right? How can I house that person in a permanent way and then provide the supportive services to help them address whatever medical, professional, personal, drug addiction, health, mental illness issues um, that they might purport to solve? So those are like when people say like, oh, what are the solutions to homelessness? Well, you prevent it from happening. You keep the short-term ones from getting real bad and you take the real bad ones and you give them housing. That said, maybe Alex, reflect a little bit about how Labra isn't a solution to homelessness, but it solves some other aspect of what it means to be human and living in poverty. So Tim talked of, about, a little bit about that, that structural change that we can make. Uh, Labra doesn't 
do that structural change, we kind of break the barrier of that us and them and have that conversation um, about just a human to human conversation, learning about them. Tim touched on this a little bit earlier as well, um, especially in talking about rural poverty. But we all have this desire for connection. Um, if we don't have that connection or even further, if if you're trying to make that connection and they're being shut down, that's going to be horrible for your mental health. So Labra um, in particular is trying to break that divide between the us and them. Um, and with that being said, uh, we're not just going out there and telling them our life story. We're pretty much sitting back listening to what they have to say um, because we on a day-to-day -day basis run into people um, say in class that you can just talk about what you did the other day. Um, but l l when you're living um, without a home, you might not run into somebody that you can share an experience that you had the day before, or maybe you might not have enough trust in a person um, to share that experience. So with Labra going back um, every week, we're trying to build kind of that, that trust and that bond between two people in order for uh, those that are experiencing homelessness to get their story heard um, and then hopefully inspire some type of change or some agent of change so that we have conversations exactly like we're having now, um, educating others that don't know so much about homelessness um, and hopefully breaking down that barrier. So the next time you walk by um, someone around Sluice campus um, and you know that they're experiencing homelessness, that instead of just passing them by or saying that you don't have money, you stop, you shake their hand to make that human connection, um, that skin to skin connection, uh, and hopefully have a deeper conversation than just saying, I don't have any money. Um, one of my, my favorite TED Talks that I've watched is by a man named Simon Sinek, and he talks about this, this businessman who is going to make a deal, um, and everything's perfectly laid out. You both agree on all the terms of the deal, and the guy says, let's shake on it, and you say, no, I'm okay. I, I don't want to shake on it. Everything's okay. He says, no, let, let's shake on the deal. And you say, no, I don't want to shake on it. Now, you're not going to have as much trust in that deal that you just made because you didn't have that human touch and that human connection. Um, so it's a very interesting idea of just shaking a hand, giving a hug to someone, b breaks that like barrier of um, the us and them and says, you know what, you're a human. Um, I'm going to sit down with you and have a talk about your life. Um, if you want to hear about my life, I'm willing to share and be vulnerable with you in in my own passions, my own um, desires in life, and possibly my own failings as well. So it's it's Labra's kind of main goal is to break that divide between the us and them, and to have that trust built between um, the students of SLU and hopefully the homeless community around St. Louis. Right. So I don't think of it as like a solution to homelessness because we're not a housing organization. We don't solve homelessness. But part of the thing that exists in our world is radical division based on difference. And that isolation harms all sides. My life is less good when I don't have the ability to be vulnerable to your lived experiences and vice versa. And in some ways, this podcast is rooted in the idea that our lives aren't as good when we don't share them in meaningful ways. So one of the things that I often reflect on is that while homelessness is rooted in profound material realities, right, you don't freeze to death because of the way people talk about freezing. You freeze to death when your body temperature drops to a point where you can't sustain life anymore. You don't starve to death because of discourses of uh, starvation, right? Or the way that we uh, agree or disagree on the definition of food deserts. It has to do with calories and the functioning of your body. But at the same time, those social realities are bound up in inextricably those material realities. How things are distributed are distributed socially. What we decide who is worth, whether or not it's someone is worth giving something to is based on our social relationship with them. Um, suddenly, um, the, the vision of a social um, rebuilding, 
right? Rebuilding the social structures that exist across difference uh, becomes a way that you can respond in an immediate way with your body, in your space, in your time. Um, and it becomes a way that you can resist and rebel against the, the structures of, of society, right? So w w what's, the, what's the trope? You know, you are walking along the street, you see a, a person who seems like they're homeless out of the corner of your eye, and you have a choice. Do you turn and look at them? Do you let them speak to you? Or do you kind of like lock your neck, secretly pretending like they don't exist because you only kind of saw them out of the periphery of your vision, lowering the amount of input, which decreases the amount of cognitive dissonance, so you don't have to deal with the fact that you're in too much of a hurry and you haven't sorted out whether or not the good things in your life they also deserve. That's the thing that gets done every single day by all kinds of people, really, really good, well-meaning, wonderful human beings who, who treat their grandma nice and go to church on Sunday or the mosque or whatever, right? Like really amazing people don't know how to deal with the profound economic differences that exist in society. And so one of the things that I think is great about Labra is it kind of offers an opportunity to train us to be able to perforate or puncture those membranes of differences um, and the meaning that is negotiated because of those differences. It's a cool, cool opportunity. No, it doesn't solve homelessness, but uh, it, it strikes against the social division that exists around difference. And Tim ta talked about those membranes that we're trying to penetrate. And one of the reflections that we had over, over the summer was the idea of the window in our cars. So a lot of the times that you're driving um, in St. Louis City, you're probably going to drive by someone who is experiencing homelessness. But for some reason, we all feel so much more comfortable and so much more distant from that person that is experiencing homelessness just because we have a piece of glass in between us. It's not even that they can't see us and we can't see them. We're both looking at each other, but we feel so much more comfortable in that little box of our car um, that we don't even want to roll down our window and acknowledge that they're a person standing on the street, um, as Tim said, doing a really shitty job trying to get money just to survive and buy food for the day. It almost seems like we're more empathetic towards people who come from other cultures and other countries than we are towards the homeless. And I, I really haven't thought about this till, till right now, but just kind of the disparity between having material goods and not having material goods for some reason. I mean, you know, I, I am going to be honest. I'm one of those people who will occasionally, you know, lock their head and just walk straight forward. I mean, I would say, you know, how, what percent of people do that? I mean, it's, it's, it's a high number of people who aren't even kind of thinking about it. You just subconsciously walk straight forward and you walk past. Whereas if you're in another situation, it's, in another situation with another type of person, like I said, from another country or another experience, you're more likely to give them your time than the homeless. Why do we, than not the, those without homes? There we go. I caught myself. Okay. Tim, Tim's over there smiling. I like it. Uh, so we oftentimes, why do we put people without homes at the kind of the lowest of our empathy meters? Yeah. I mean, part of it, I think is uh, the American dream. We believe that this is a place where you can make it if you try. Therefore, if you haven't made it, you haven't tried, right? And so I think that there's this sense that if you were born in the United States, we, we sent you to school, we gave you these opportunities, and now you fucked it up, right? And it's on you. Um, and that, I think, uh, discourse of individuality um, becomes kind of like a profound barrier between uh, people who are suffering and uh, people who are suffering in different ways. Um, I think one of the things that's really powerful about recognizing how you can change your own, the way that you interact with people who are different than you, um, is that it opens you, as Alex said earlier, to all of the wisdom and life experiences that they have too. Um, there are things that I can learn from someone who has been forced to interact with police officers in profoundly different ways than, than I do, right? And if I have the forbearance or the fortitude to, to walk with that person as they relive those sufferings for me, and I have the grace to see that as a gift and not an attack, I can learn so much more. Um, 
and to be able to share those sufferings, uh, but also to see the heroism uh, implicit in, uh, in their lives and to also share in the joy and to laugh alongside them um, and to come to have uh, awe in the beauty of the humanness that exists in front of me. Those are all things that are available if you have the time to have the conversation. I will say, though, you have to pay attention so you can... Um, kind of like, what's the word I'm looking for? Idealistically imagine that all people who are living on the streets are just dying, waiting to have somebody show up and treat them like a human and give their life meaning, legitimacy, because sometimes they're trying to brush their teeth, right? And what they need is privacy. And so sometimes the locked head is a blessing, right? If you're trying to take a shower along the side of a road and you've got to, you're in a hurry because you're trying to go to a job interview or something like this or meet your kid and you need to shower and you're like showering, you don't want anyone to watch you, right? So it's not as simple as, oh, turn and have a meaningful conversation with every person that you ever walk past on the streets. Um, it's that depending on the situation, uh, y you, you may be able to provide uh, a, a a blessed amount of humanness um, and you may be able to ignore them in a moment that they need to be ignored. Um, my, my wife recently was reflecting on how trying to have a conversation with people through her car window while waiting at stoplights is an opportunity to treat them as humans. But if they're there for money and she soaks up the time while the light is red, like trying to have her humanizing conversation, she might limit their ability to get the cash that they need to solve a real problem that they have in their lives. So it's not s simple, but it is a thing that as you try to do, as you do more, go out with a friend who has gone out on outreach before, um, or talk to someone that you have seen on your way to work or your way home from school um, more regularly. And as you become more comfortable, your judgment starts to improve and you can make better choices about who wants to be engaged, who should be engaged, who might need to be engaged, and in what way. To add on to that, I, I think we all have had those days in our lives where we, at the end of the day, we just want to have nothing more than time to ourselves and not to interact with any human being. So turning the head could be, like Tim said, a blessing in disguise because for some reason that person might have had a really rough day, uh, might have been standing for you know 14 hours from sunup to sundown uh, in the St. Louis heat in the middle of the summer, and they just don't want to have a conversation with you at that moment. Um, but again, kind of breaking that barrier shaking their hand, learning their names. Learning names could probably be one of the largest impacts you could have because you're going to see that person, especially if you're in the same area for an extended period of time. You're going to see that person walking around uh, multiple times. So to be able to go up to them and say, hello, um, John, it's great to see you again. I hope you're doing well. Um, let me know if I can do anything to help you out. Um, just extending an offer and it I think learning their names is probably a huge step um, in breaking down those barriers. And just kind of, I think the privacy that you get from having a home is just so, you can't even really describe it because, you know, we've all been had those moments where we are either lonely and we need somebody or we just want to be alone or we just want to be vulnerable. And like, you know, I remember, you know, last year I lived with four other roommates and, and I loved living with all of them, but like some of the best times were when all of them would be gone and I'd have the, the place to myself because it's like, that moment of privacy that I think we all crave. And so kind of to experience your life and your human, your humanness without that moment of privacy where you have four walls and a roof around you, it's got to be very, very trying. And, and it's got to be one of the most vulnerable things in humanity is to be homeless. I, it, Cause you know, I think we often take for granted and especially those of us, you know, who have homes, we take for granted having a home and especially being raised in a family, you know, where we've always had a home and you haven't had those problems. There's so many issues that, that arise from being homeless, but I want to get back and do a few more of these solutions and kind of a little bit about, you know, we talked about, you know, the simple solution to homelessness is giving people a home. And what are some other things though, on top of that, that also, improve homelessness is this mental health education is this mental health you know what what are some other things because home isn't necessarily the only step no of course it's not so the the model that is currently used to address chronic homelessness so homelessness that has happened multiple times over the last couple of years or who or that has lasted longer than a year uh, is a strategy called permanent supportive housing so the housing part is a home 
right? The permanent part is that it doesn't have conditions or a time limit, right? So it's not like, oh, well, you have six months, and if you after, after that, you've got to get your own job and get your own life together. Um, and the problem is, is that we've never found a time limit that actually addresses the kinds of issues that people who've been living on the streets for a really long time face, right? So how long do you think it takes to overcome alcoholism? A long, long time. Right. So if I've got somebody who hasn't worked, um, who isn't in touch with their family, uh, who's struggling with a drug addiction, this is not going to be a six month problem. Right. There are people who have been homeless literally every day since Vietnam. Like it's laughable, the idea that you could just like give them two years of housing and they're just going to be like self-sufficient after that. Self-sufficiency isn't a thing that all people have. And we accept that out of our grandma or something like this after she gets to a certain age. Oh, like we don't expect her to be self-sufficient. Um, so we there is a place in our mind, in our hearts, for people who cannot provide everything for themselves that they need, right? And there are certain kinds of people who, for whatever reason, have come to a place where they cannot fully provide for themselves. So permanent supportive housing becomes an option for them. So the permanent part is no timeline. The housing part is a home, right? And then the supportive is that thing that you're talking about, the wraparound services that exist to address the other issues that they might be experiencing that could be related or unrelated to their poverty, right? So often um, there are... Um, uh, people who help connect you to health insurance and get you to doctors, right? Um, uh, mental health care, uh, substance abuse, uh, group counseling. Um, so those are kind of like the more clinical or recovering from an illness kind of thing. But if you think about it, um, it doesn't actually solve the social problem uh, of homelessness to like get all of the people who are currently home homeless and then put them in a house and then get them like addicted to I Love Lucy reruns. Like that doesn't actually constitute an improvement of their life. Um, and so you would also want to create like, like, you know, gardening programs or art therapy or, you know, storytelling or music or cooking classes, right? Like when you start to think like, what are the things that humans need in order to thrive? Like that is always, in my opinion, the ultimate answer to any question of injustice. What is it that humans need in order to become more human? What is it that we need in order to thrive? How can we negotiate the nature of our interdependence? And what steps do we need to take in order to move towards that? Right. And so different permanent supportive housing um, projects take different philosophies. Some of them build health clinics in the downstairs and then put the housing upstairs. Others are partners um, with, uh, you know, health health care providers. Um, but the trick is finding um, finding the things uh, that the population needs and finding ways to afford them, um, you know, through government grants and donations and investments and, um, you know, other forms of social enterprise, uh, finding ways to actually sustain that. Uh, then becomes the trick. Um, I'm going to bring in my econ background a little bit. We talk a lot about uh, efficiency and inefficiency within uh, certain markets, and the what what drives me up a wall about those experiencing homelessness. Um, I guess that's not the right way to phrase it, but it's it's that there is no efficient way to do this because every single person has a situation that is very unique and they're going to need specific services directed to them. So Tim mentioned someone that might need uh, mental health issue, uh, mental health um, help. But what if that person has mental health issues because of domestic violence? And then because of that, they turn to alcoholism or um, drug addiction. So then you have all these issues layered on top of each other. So there's no one program or there's not even 10 programs or, you know, 100 programs that can solve homelessness because every single person has an individual need. Um, so that's what drives me up a wall is that there's just no single solution um, to kind of solve this issue of homelessness. I do like uh, Tim's uh, kind of, def um, def what is it, diffusion, di diversion, prevention, and housing. So I really, I do, I think that's a great step to take, but these programs that we do have within cities can only do so much. Um, so it's kind of the responsibility of everyone else, um, especially us as, as college students to, learn about these issues and be able to um, interact with each individual person and try to figure out what their needs are and how we can best meet that individual person's needs. If we're going to go an econ angle, uh, I'll also, uh, one of my 
pet peeves is that um, markets are poorly designed for what we might say are non-ideal workers. So like most jobs are designed for like 20 hour or 30 or 40 or 60 hours a week from one single person engaging in that labor in one particular place. And there are plenty of people who can work for one day and then maybe not the next day because their back hurts too bad, but uh, two or three days days later, but depending on how bad that bad their back hurt, right? Um, But we don't structure labor that way. Um, And so I think it's important to recognize that the way that labor is structured could be different. We could live in a society where there was just a giant computer database and we woke up and the algorithm randomly assigned us to do something that day, right? We could live in a society where we only ever did the things that our grandfather did, right? Um, And that as labor markets change and as people start new innovations and as technology changes, one of the things that we have to ask ourselves is how is the labor market uh, organized, distributed, structured, and who does it advantage and disadvantage, right? And so someone who can work, but not all of the time, there's almost no place for them to labor in a way that other people find valuable. Um, there are some programs uh, who have started to play with alternate models um, where they'll hire people for a day um, and they'll do that every day, um, or uh, they um, get people and they get them to create art or mosaics or things like this and then they sell them. Um, so there are models uh, that are kind of sort of like scratching at the edge of how you might design labor economies. Um, because if we can design better labor economies, then the markets will solve their own inefficiencies, or at least that's the the goal, right? Give homeless people more money, um, and they'll be able to have more power over shaping what their solution should look like, as opposed to um, when you can't pay for something, there will always be this sense that you don't know what you need. Um, and so people will design those solutions for them, which are not always efficient. I heard a great interview the other day, and this was by Jordan Peterson, who I've referenced on the podcast before, but I really like him. And he was talking about if you have some capital, it's easier to get more capital. But if you have no capital, it's almost impossible to get some capital. And so it's you know, a really big difference between um, you know being able to have, like you said, what do you what do I actually need versus you know I don't know what I actually need. And so something that I see too is a, is a big problem that you know really I think maybe is the primary to homeless to those without homes moving forward is this technology skill gap that we're going to be able to see. Because if you have access to a computer, you can do so much in today's economy. But if you're you know, without a home and you don't have a computer and you have no access to technology or Wi-Fi, you're going to put yourself in a position where you're now behind you know, sixth and seventh graders as far as looking for jobs and, and, and you know, people of all ages. And so how do we kind of bridge this technological gap? Perfect. Yeah. So tech diffusion uh, in the community of people who live without homes kind of depends on where you are in there. So you're 100 percent correct that uh, somebody who's 65 who's living on the streets, they they are often going to struggle with their lack of kind of technological connectedness. Uh, When I lived in Phoenix, I worked with a street outreach organization and the young adults that we served with that organization were incredibly connected. Um, one of the things that you can do is you can take a cell phone that has no service, but hook it up so it gets Wi-Fi, and then lurk out of places with free Wi-Fi and have like pretty legit connectivity. Um, so much so that at the time I didn't use Facebook, but I joined Facebook so that I could interact with my homeless friends. So. You're not wrong that uh, poverty and uh, tech divides um, derive in significant ways in injustices, but I think that um, it's important to recognize that most people who can get their hands on cell phones do, and that that's a global phenomenon, right? Someone who's never seen a computer before in Africa often still knows how to operate a phone. And so one of the things I actually advocate for is finding textual interactivity with broader database issues. I think that there is no reason I shouldn't be able to text community information referral and answer a short text survey about what my needs are and then be texted the different organizations and the criteria that are necessary and then be able to text back and say, I want to be in contact with A, B, and C. And when the caseworker wakes up the next morning, 
something and opens their computer, it should be my text message. This idea that I need to call or walk in the front door or talk to this organization and get referred to that other organization, like that's purely a technological problem that is easily solvable uh, by creating like the right parser that can work through the logic trees and send the text queries um, that are necessary. We can do it um, in Ebola outbreaks um, in other countries. We could do it in the United States. And so that's something that, that is really interesting, um, and I haven't even thought about that, but for our entrepreneurs out there listening, that would be a good thing to think about is just how do you come up with a system of kind of letting people know, you know, this is what the place I need to go, this is the institution I need to go see. Are there any programs out there doing this right now, or maybe are there programs trying to get, you know, technology into the hands of the impoverished? Yeah, I mean, so importantly... <laughs> Almost every solution that you can think of, there is a major, well-funded, long-term, expertly staffed, professionally run nonprofit organization who does it. So community information referral is often run by like the United Way of the region that it's in. There's websites that um, they, that can access the different services. Usually there's a call center um, and you can talk through things. Um, so there are, there are people who are doing real and important work in these spaces. Um, but yeah, there are also real tech gaps uh, that exist in human services. Uh, part of it, I think, is um, our own failing to recognize that um, innovation uh, drives uh, social transformation. Um, uh, so like a reticence to invest um, in the, the, the kind of developmental uh, 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 initiatives that are necessary for creating new processes. Um, but uh, e even in those spaces, so there's a St. Louis organization um, called Global Hack, who last year ran a hackathon around creating a coordinated entry system to integrate with um, HMIS, homeless information management systems, uh, across nonprofit organizations so that I could walk into one organization, get an assessment done, and instantaneously know um, which organizations would be applicable to me, but then also already be known by those organizations when I showed up because I'd be pulled up on the same system. So there are people, yeah, not gnawing on on the, the, the edges of that problem, but it's definitely a way forward. Um, homelessness is a data light environment. So many people who have their cell phone on all the time and um, buy everything from Amazon, like we're over surveilled um, and our privacy is being violated in various digital ways all of the time. But in the homeless context, yeah, it's, it's harder to track. It's harder to um, predict. Um, and there's a certain freedom in that, um, but there's also a way that we also don't necessarily understand the scope of our the problem that we as a community are facing because of those data gaps. An additional obstacle as well um, for some of these programs and these applications and things of this sort is transportation as well. So you might get referred to a certain program, but say that program is a 20 minute car ride away. Um, we, if you have a car, um, you might be able to get there in 20 minutes without traffic, but say you're experiencing homelessness and you've made $10 today, um, a bus ticket to that program might cost you, you know, five bucks to get there and back. And that bus might take you two to three hours to get there. So you're also giving up that opportunity cost um, that we talk a lot, a lot about in econ. You're giving up your time that you could be getting more money for food um, to go to this program. So then that night you're not going to eat um, and you're going to give up your entire day just to get to that program to maybe be put in a system um, to get help. So it's another obstacle is that transportation costs um, and time costs to get to these different programs around the city. One of the things that I argue is that when you stack up the amount of time it takes to wait in line to get food, the complexity of the bureaucracies you have to navigate in order to get services, how you pull together all of these different disparate nonprofit organizations to actually meet your needs, I believe that it's harder to live homelessly than it is to start a new business. And when you think about the systems that exist to help people start new businesses, um, it, it's not only easier, bureaucratically more simple, and um, 
more or less more straightforward, uh, you have more support. Um, and so one of the things that people very rarely think of is someone who's like navigating their life between the food stamp office and disability social security um, and this permanent supportive housing organization. We rarely think of them as entrepreneurs but the skills that are required for cobbling together these like diverse set of resources is profoundly entrepreneurial. And that's one of the reasons that um, many of the people that I meet uh, who live without homes are so wise is because they've been forced to deal in really sparse conditions, which has driven innovation and creative thinking and all of these things that we go on and on about in like the business context, right? Um, but we reward ingenuity profoundly differently based on the amount of resources we allow the person to be ingenious with. And so we don't reward ingenuity when it comes to the resources for your day-to-day -day survival. We only reward it when it's a surplus, right? Um, but the, the entrepreneurial spirit that undergirds people in poverty all across the world uh, who are faced with problems that uh, are crippling, sometimes literally, uh, there's a lot to, to learn from that, a lot to admire about that, a lot to honor in that. Um, and even as uh, we organize and fight and struggle and create relationships to overcome those sufferings that they have faced, um, there's a way to do that with a vulnerable heart um, to learn um, those hard-won lessons, right? And that there's a kind of a truth, uh, be it economic, entrepreneurial, personal, or spiritual, that is only won through suffering. I think that might be a perfect place to end it right there. That was beautifully said, Tim. And I think, you know, bringing up this idea of, Alex, I really liked how you pointed out, there's just not one solution for homelessness, and, and nor will there ever be because every person is so different and what they need and what they want is so different. And so I think, like we talked about, just one of the easiest ways is just to go out there and actually have a conversation with someone. I mean, I, you know, how much does saying hi to someone in the hallway change their day versus not walking past someone and, and not saying hi? I mean, it's as simple as, as a hello to, to brighten someone's day and help liven it up. And I know it's a cliche we say all the time, but you know, as we talked about on this podcast, it is very, very true. And so this is another one of those episodes where we don't come away with very many answers, but we have a lot of questions and it's a good time for people to think about those without homes and those in extreme poverty and just ways that we can, you know, navigate it and come together as, as understanding that we're both part of this human experience and we're both part of this human race. So I want to thank both of you again for coming on today. This has been a really powerful podcast and I know you guys will enjoy it. Um, Alex? Yeah. If I can, if I can challenge the listeners of this podcast to do one thing, it would, uh, to become informed, especially within your own city or wherever you're living, with the policies that are in place by the local governments. Um, I don't think we do that enough, and those that are experiencing homelessness know firsthand how these policies affect them. Um, so if we are also informed on these issues um, through reading, I think uh, we can start to make some real change as well. One of my least favorite phrases is being a voice for the voiceless, but I might challenge someone to be an ear to the earless what things are already be, being said that no one in your life ever hears because they don't take the time yeah very powerful and very well said and i think like you like you talked about is just even letting people know of services and, and letting people know what's going on in this city and just you know even it's easy as making a flyer and, and printing it out and, and handing it to the homeless is one of those things that you can do but once again challenging thoughts challenging ideas and we've got a lot to think about and chew on and and work out and hopefully you know maybe this is something we can do again and talk about you know maybe there'll be changes in, in government policy and i don't know how much has changed in the previous years but uh we'll see and i want to thank you guys so much for joining us again and until next time have a great rest of your day